Hello everyone, this is Asim. Welcome back to our channel. Happy New Year to all. And with this new year, I'm going to start a new series on GraphQL. I took a poll on my uh, Telegram channel called Hacking Simplified, which has around 1100 users. So I mentioned how many of you are comfortable with GraphQL exploitation. There were around 200 people who saw the poll. Only 77 of them uh, actually interacted with the poll. And out of that, 45% of them mentioned that it would be great if you make a video series on that. This Telegram channel is where I try to test out ideas if people are willing to get or to know about those things or if, if there's something that I feel that maybe making a video would be beneficial to all. So I usually make poll around that here and ask from the viewers whether they would like to have it or not. This is the channel. Um, the link of the channel is in the description of this video as well or you can click on this link itself. Another way I take feedback from people is use this Google form feedback hacking simplified channel. The link for this would also be in the description of the channel. You can rate the technical aspect, you know, what all could be improved, what age group do you belong to, how frequently and this is any other feedback or requests if you feel to connect with me or ask any questions. So usually people tell about what feedback they have, whether the sound is not working or maybe you could make a video like this or if they have any video request, they put it here itself. So that, that was about the channel and if you are new to it, you would get to know about these things. Let me just close these now. Let's come back to the meat of this channel. So before you go into the exploitation of GraphQL, you need to understand what GraphQL is, why it's being used and what, what uh, is it even being used uh, popularly in big projects or in bigger companies so that you can even try to look for bugs on those companies. So those are things that I would try to tackle in this video. This video series would have, a, I think, six or seven videos in total. There would be different uh, parts of exploitation of this. In the first part, that is this part. I'll be talking about uh, the GraphQL thing, what, why and how. First, I would show what's the problem that GraphQL is solving. Earlier, how this used to be solved, um, that was REST APIs and SOAP. So I would be showing you a REST API demo. On the screen, you can already see this req res.in. So I'll be showing this how and why this is less efficient than GraphQL. Then we'll dive into the intro of GraphQL where I would uh, also show you a live demo of GraphQL. That demo is already available online so even you can interact in your own time. So you get you can get your hands dirty and you can actually feel how GraphQL is different from uh, this REST API. So both the links would be in the description also. When both the major technologies are covered, I would try to show you a side-by-side -side comparison for easy understanding as to what are the differences between REST and GraphQL. So even if you, are, if you don't know what REST API is, what GraphQL is, if you have not done any website development, anything like that, stay with me, you would get to understand all of these. These are just terms, but it's very easy, you would have definitely seen or you would have interacted with this technology once in a while, that's for sure. Then we would see how widely GraphQL is adopted, where I would show you some of the stacks, some of the companies that is that have been widely using this. Like Facebook is one of them. Facebook created GraphQL and they have been using it extensively throughout their applications. Towards the end, we would see if it is exploitable, where I would try to show you the different reports and what kind of uh, exploitation is being done in this, what kind of bounties people get, those kinds of things that I would try to show. In the end, I would show uh, further plan on series what's the next episode about. So that was the whole gist and overview of it. So I would try to add timestamps so that you can skip to the part that you feel interesting or you feel relatable. I try to make it short, but yeah, stay with me till the end and you would definitely enjoy this. So the first is, uh, what's the problem that GraphQL is trying to solve? So before GraphQL was there, uh, any website or even before any of those, so this is the uh, web development console, you can click on right and click inspect, then this would be shown. So here let's come to this network tab, I've clicked on this fetch xhr and this preserve log is come, clicked here. Don't, don't get intimidated by it, I'm just gonna talk about it, I was just preparing the screen before I start talking about it. So. What happens before any of these REST, GraphQL, forget all these things, just try to understand once you open a website, what happens? You, you let's say you go to this req res.in, 
you click on this then this website loads right there's the there's data that's being transferred on the whole page but sometimes what happens is you click on the link the page does not reload but the data is already there right so those are basically requests that are being sent in the back and then those are received on the front a lot of these are called xhr requests um, basically xml http request that's not very relevant to this rest or graphql discussion but i'm just adding the information here so <coughs> rest api is rep representational state transfer api and if you if you like i was talking about how data was being transferred so till very recently like in the, for the past 10 15 years rest api has been rest is very popular for transferring data from website to the users browser so let's say i want to get the list of all users if i click on this list users it does this uh, website request rq rest dot in slash api slash users question mark page equal to 2 and you see type is xhr if i click on this i would see what what are the headers that are being sent with the request what is the response header what is the request header what is the payload that was being sent which is just a query string parameter question mark page equal to 2 is the query string parameter let's see the preview so if you see this is the response data that i got from the website is the same here if you see this is the same here so if you notice one thing uh if i clicked on the list users i got a list of all users but it just not contains the list of users it also contains the <coughs> email first name last name avatar and all these things right so it's just not the list of users let's say i just wanted the list of or the email of all the users or let's say i just wanted the id of the or the name of the all users that's not what i'm getting i'm getting all the all the data of like let's say uh, a set of these five data points i'm getting for all the users so <coughs> you can easily understand that could be one of the drawback because it's sending a lot of data that may not be required by the by the client or the by the browser let's check for single user so if, if we click on single user we do a request call let's say user slash 2 i think that's the request here user slash 2 the response is this is the data avatar email first name id last name which is the same here uh, avatar first name last name email id and then there is this support uh, data also which contains the url and text so basically if i just try to fetch the email of a single user by giving their id which is two here i am i don't i don't have any way to do that i am getting all the like all the five key points here that is one of the drawback that graphql tries to solve that you can actually ask for very specific data from the backend and it would return just that particular data so that is one of the what do you say uh, benefit of graphql let's let me show you one of the uh, graphql explorer so this is uh, this website link would be in the description this is a graphql online explorer so i can just do query on it and it would send the data onto that so let's say the query is countries and names so i want all the countries name so this has some data of countries so i just want that let me run this i am clicking on here and it would just show the countries and name let's say i wanted to add something else uh let's say country which continent it belongs so this country thing oh sorry let's say uh the capital of the country and let's say i also want the currency of the country so only these three things i want so if i do now query i would just get like let's say united arab emirates abu dhabi is the capital ad is the currency afghanistan kabul currency is afn so like these you get all the data and only the specific data that you want so this is one of the benefit that graphql offers it basically creates the data as a graph and there is this graphql server that transforms the query and get fetch the data from <coughs> from the backend <coughs> you can also uh do what is a filtering on this so let's say if you don't want all the countries you can just mention countries and then you can do a filtering that only india or only afghanistan only usa something like that and you can get data for that particular country only so you don't get all the data you can just filter out the data and it can be done from the front end from the browser itself so that is one of the benefits that is very apparent and that was one of the reason why a uh, graphql was created in the first place Let's talk about what's GraphQL then. Uh, I think with the demo you already got what it is. So GraphQL is an open source data query and manipulation language for APIs, and a runtime for fulfilling queries with existing data. 
GraphQL was developed internally by Facebook in 2020 before releasing publicly in 2015. If I show, go to the page. <coughs> so here in the introduction to GraphQL, they mention GraphQL is a query language for your API and a server side runtime for executing queries using a type system you define in your data. GraphQL isn't tied to any specific database or storage engine and is instead backed by your existing code and data. What this essentially means is that GraphQL can run on any of the backend databases, any of the storage engine, it doesn't matter what that is. So what happens is there's a GraphQL server, you just provide the schema of the backend database. Let's say you say that, okay, countries, there's a country and it has these three or four or five fields. So if the front end or the client, if the user queries that particular thing with those particular specific fields, it transforms that query and tries to fetch the data, only those specific data points and returns back. So that's what a GraphQL server does and that's what the GraphQL is all about. So if I show you here, uh, let's say I go to this query. So you can see there's this continents, continent, countries, country, languages, language. So if I just click on, let's say continent, I see there's this code thing. If I click on country, I see there's this country type. It contains name, native, phone, continent, and that's what I saw. So these are the different fields. So in the backend, let's say whatever database they're using, it would have these particular columns. So these particular data that is being exposed to the GraphQL server. So anyone using this GraphQL, yeah, what do I say, yeah, user interface, they can query on these particular things and get these particular data only. Now let's come to the side by side comparison. We already sh talked about both the technologies. I showed you a demo of both of them. Let's see a side by side comparison. This is an image I found online. It has a SOAP APIs as well. So it was a very previous implementation of getting data. Uh, you can already see it's late 1990s. Then came the REST APIs with the 2000s and GraphQL, which is very latest. I already mentioned that in 2015, <coughs> it was publicly released by Facebook. SOAP used, it, uh, used XML, which is uh, extensible markup language. It already has a huge size and REST can use XML, JSON, HTML, YAML, any of those kinds of things. GraphQL specifically uses only JSON. The key idea here in the SOAP was that there should be a single endpoint URI for fetching your modifying data, which is what similar to GraphQL. So GraphQL has the same endpoint. You can define your query and on the basis of query, you fetch your data. In the REST API, as you would have seen here, there are different APIs. Let's say for this single user, you need to fetch the user ID. For list users, there was this user's endpoint. So the client or the website also, like the front end that's created, they need to have all these queries as well. They, they cannot be just one endpoint and you can be doing queries around that. Whereas in GraphQL, you can you just have this particular endpoint that is uh, countries.trevorblaze.com and you define your query as whatever you want. So front end can define whatever query they want and on the basis of that, they get the data. So that basically, uh, releases the knowledge silo that needs to be created. Like the front end doesn't need to know what are different endpoints as they need to know in the REST API case. That is one of the advantages GraphQL has. Uh, this is old data, uh, single data query endpoint, lightweight, lightweight, strong data typing, multiple type formats, strong data typing. GraphQL has strong data typing. So transfer over many protocol, HTTP, SMTP, FTP, REST is stateless, efficient data fetching, Advantages uh, in SOAP, there was over or under fetching of data. It was very verbose. The whole XML file would be needed to send, which used to contain a lot of irrelevant or rather say duplicated data, which was not required. A lot of XML tags, which were not required to actually get the data. REST API has the same issue. I told you that there were five fields which were not relevant. I just wanted the email of the users, but I was still getting all the data. So that's not required, right? And let's say if I want to uh, do some other queries. Uh, let's say I want to get the user and then I want to get the user's, let's say, uh, profile data. So first I need to fetch the user email, then I maybe I need to using the email, I need to query something else. So that required multiple calls. So that's why I mentioned multiple trips. In GraphQL, there's a lack of versioning. So in APIs, what people do is let's say they are creating a new API and they're deprecating the previous one or removing some previous endpoint. So what they do is they add a slash v1 slash v2 kind of, uh, let's say, this is the website uh, API slash users question mark page equal to two. Let's say they are working on some new feature and they are experimenting onto it. So what they would do is API slash V2 slash users, something like that. So that that's not publicly available. Not everyone is using, but also they can, without breaking the actual front end, they can still keep on working. 
whereas with graphql this there's no versioning involved which i think that's why they meant it they made it in that way that you can have only one source of truth that one schema and on the basis of that you can have all the data there there doesn't need to be a versioning there there is no caching on graphql that's for sure uh, because it's querying every time so there is no cache i think the people have implemented third party caches to uh, create this kind of uh, benefit on graphql as well uh, soap was obviously inefficient that's for sure and there was no caching as well so these these are the main kinds of uh, differences on graphql soap and rest okay now you may say okay i seem this looks all good and nice and facebook has created facebook is using but what about other companies is there any other company that's using so one of the very popular companies that you already know hacker one they also use graphql but let's see which other companies so this is called stackshare.io this is a website where people usually share their tech stack that these are technologies that we are using and if you see here there are 22.7 thousand stacks that's using graphql it already has 18.7 thousand followers 1655 companies reportedly use graphql in their tech stacks including facebook shopify and instagram you can see facebook shopify instagram twitter stackshare new york times tokopedia kavak stack and you can see a lot of others you just sign up on this website and you can see a lot of big companies moving or shifting part of their at least web application onto graphql so that is a major thing <coughs> i already have a few websites here why we use graphql and then it has some comparisons and few graphs as well like this one is there graphql versus rest graphql versus what you uh, graphql versus rest what you did not know about graphql so these are different links i would add into the description so that you can go and read because uh, these have a lot of information but adding all these into the video would obviously extend the video a lot now let's see if the what kind of bugs and are there any bugs being found on these so if you just search hacker one graphql you would find a lot of these uh, reports about hacker one leakage and if you go to the activity you can also see there's this a lot of reports around graphql and stuff if i just show you some of these privacy member disclosure via graphql graphql introspection is enabled and leaks detail CSRF on API graph allows executing mutations. Confidential data of users. Introspection leaks sensitive GraphQL leads to sensitive. So you can very easily guess that a lot of these are sensitive data disclosure, and that is what has been the case in GraphQL thing, because a lot of because it's a very new technology, and a lot of these companies, even Facebook itself, they have a very huge uh, GraphQL schema. Uh, schema. So a lot of times they forget or they miss to. restrict a particular field which uh, should not be displayed onto the front end so let's say in this uh, graphql online so let's say they, they 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 didn't want to instead of country let's say it was a user uh, object which was being queried and <coughs> on the user object there was a phone thing so let's say the uh, the backend developer they forgot to restrict the phone field so anyone can using the graphql query get anyone else's phone data so that's a big data leak and that would be uh, adding to a huge bounty so that is mostly the case in this like usually there is sensitive information disclosure mostly few first people they try to do an introspection query and then they try to do that Let, let's not get into the technical details as i will teach you about these things introspection query how to find these graphql endpoints how to exploit those then we would get into deep dive but rest assured that in most of the cases there is this sensitive information disclosure that's happening here in some of the cases you can also be able to modify the data because of this thing called uh, executing mutations so mutations are basically post queries for modifying data as is the same in rest api we will be talking about it let's not go into the depth of it now let's talk about what what would be talking about in the next videos in the upcoming series so there is this dam vulnerable graphql application so i'm going to use this in the first video I'll try to set this up on your local machine or on using docker or something and then i will try to do these scenarios so they they have a lot of scenarios which are very relevant in the current scene so we will try to cover those in one of these videos so yeah we will start with this discovering and uh, fingerprinting so in the next video first we will do a setup of this and then we will do this discovering and fingerprinting with that said let's wrap this up hope you enjoyed the video and if you like the channel make sure to subscribe it and like the video share it with your friends and Hopefully we will reach 10k very soon. Thank you. Have a nice day.